Welcome back. Our next subject is to talk about energy. And we all have this vague concept of what energy is, right? Toddlers have a lot of energy, like they go oh, crazy. You know, it's like 10 o'clock at night and they're still awake. You're like, how are you doing that? Um, but what is it? What, what actually is energy? And you're like, well, you know, it's just, it's energy. It's, 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 it's just what you need to do things. And when you get to that point, you're actually now to a useful definition. So it turns out that energy is just the ability to do work. Now work has a very specific definition, we're not going to talk too much about that in detail, but it's, it's the ability to do stuff. If you have energy, you can do stuff. If you don't have energy, you can't do stuff, and your phone works that way too, right? Your battery's charged, you can do stuff. Your battery's not charged, you can't do anything. And so it's the ability to do work, and we're going to use that in this class. We're going to do all sorts of things with energy in this class. But one of the things we need to know, we've, we've decided that units are important, right? If I say, hey, can I have three hot dogs and you give me three salamanders, you got the number right, but the units are wrong, it's not a very useful solution to my problem. So we need to talk about the units that we use for energy. And it turns out there's two of the primary units that we use that is probably 90% or 95% of the energy units we'll run across. And these are the joule and the calorie. Now, a joule and a calorie <coughs> are related to one another, and we'll see how they are in just a minute. The joule is <coughs> named after a scientist who uh, was one of the first to really discover and prove that energy can be changed from one form to another. And so if you think about, you know, you, you, you climb up onto a desk and you stand on top of the desk. You had to use energy to do that. But what you were using the energy to do is to climb up higher. Now, if you fell off that desk, you're gonna take that energy, right? You know, it's called potential energy. And you're gonna turn that into what's called kinetic energy because you fall down. And so you've changed gravitational energy into kinetic energy. And then when you hit the bottom, poof, that kinetic energy goes away. And it turns out that it goes usually into heat energy. So you're actually warming up yourself on the floor when you hit it. So Joule really proved that you could actually interconvert types of energy. In fact, there's this great story of Joule when he was on his honeymoon. And uh, he had this theory about being able to convert gravitational potential energy into um, kinetic energy into heat energy. And so when he went on his honeymoon, he went to a place where there were lots of waterfalls. And so he's like, hey, I'm on my honeymoon. You know what I should do on my honeymoon? Science. And so he had a thermometer with him. Now, back then, if you wanted to take really accurate, accurate and precise uh, measurements of temperature, you had to have a big thermometer. So he had a six foot tall thermometer with him. And there he was on his honeymoon, hiking to the top of a waterfall with his six foot thermometer alone on his honeymoon. And he actually ran across another famous scientist whose name is Lord Kelvin, randomly in the mountains. Crazy story, really. But what he was trying to do is he was going to measure the temperature of the water at the top, measure the temperature of the water at the bottom, and hope that there was an increase in temperature. Now, it turns out all sorts of other things happened, so that experiment didn't work out very well for him. But he was still able to prove what he wanted to prove doing other experiments. So we named a unit of energy after him. And then there's also the calorie. And a calorie has a very specific uh, definition. It's the energy required to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if you've got a gram of water, and if you remember gram of water, the density of water is one, and so you've got a milliliter of water. It's the energy it takes to heat up that one little milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. That's the calorie. Now, calorie is often abbreviated C-A-L, and the joule is often abbreviated with a capital J. And so we're going to use those abbreviations more commonly when we talk about them. There is a relationship between joules and calories. There's 4.184 joules in one calorie. And it turns out this is an exact number. It's a definition. It's actually what defines the joule. And <coughs> 
And so there's our relationship between joules and calories. I do expect you to be able to use this number, so have it on hand and available for yourself to be able to know that 4.184 joules is one calorie. Uh, <clears throat> oftentimes we'll also see other units. We'll see kilojoules, but we know now that the kilo is just a prefix. It just means a thousand of them. So a kilojoule is a thousand joules. You will see people use a kilocalorie. And that just means a thousand calories. You'll also see people use a capital calorie, and a capital calorie is a kilocalorie, and it is 1,000 calories. So we'll see those units as well. And of course, we can put any unit prefix we want in front of joules, and any unit prefix we want in front of calories. I could say I've got millijoules, I could say I've got gigajoules, and those are perfectly okay ways of doing it. What we can use? These four is for interconversion, so we will sometimes get things in joules, sometimes in calories, and we'll need to convert them. So if I say, hey, I've got uh, 1,870 joules, and then how many calories do I have? I can go ahead and put that into an equation. Remember how we're gonna set up all of our conversions this class, is we're gonna write what we start with on the left, what we're looking for on the right, a set of parentheses to say I've got a conversion factor. What's gonna go on the bottom here? Now hopefully you didn't come up with a number first. If you came up with a number first, you're still in that number mindset, but we wanna be in the unit mindset. We gotta get our units right first before we get our numbers. So down there has to be joules, because we always cancel one on top, one on bottom. Up here has to be calories, because that's what we wanna get at the end. And so there we go, we've got calories and joules. If you look back up, I've got my conversion between calories and joules up here, and I've got my 4.184 joules is one calorie. The 4.184 is attached to joules, and so it stays attached to joules down here, 4.184 joules in one calorie. Again, never memorize that a number goes on top and a number goes on bottom. It changes with every conversion problem. Memorize that numbers stay attached to their units. So this is just a calculator problem. You grab your calculator out, and what are you gonna type? You're gonna type 1870 divided by 4.184, and what I get is 446.9407, etc. What do I do with that number? I always check for sig figs. What do I have here? Three or four sig figs? Hopefully you came up with it. There were three sig figs, because that trailing zero is not significant, because there's no decimal. How about this one? How many sig figs there? Exact. We just said it was an exact one. It looks like there's four sig figs, but it's a definition. This is kind of a complicated one because it's got this decimal, but it's exact. And so three sig figs exact. We're going to only get three sig figs at the end. We're going to round that up to 447 and then make sure we have our units, which is calories. So that's how we do a conversion problem between joules and calories. And since you're so good at that now, it is your turn to try it out. And we're gonna ask you, what is 15.0 calories in joules? So go ahead and pause the video and try it out. Welcome back. What'd you come up with? Hopefully you came up with something like this. We're gonna start with calories. We're gonna look for joules. We're gonna make our parentheses. What goes on the bottom? Calories, because it's always one on top, one on the bottom. What goes on top? Joules, so that we get joules where we want to get joules. 4.184 joules is one calorie. Numbers stay attached to their units. So you see how in the previous problem, 4.184 went on the bottom. In this one, it went on the top. So if you memorize, hey, it goes on the top, or hey, it goes on the bottom, you're going to be wrong roughly half the time. That you just plug into your calculator. 15 times 4, what is that? That's somewhere in the 60s. And so you get 62.8 joules. Three sig figs here, three sig figs there. Our next subject is temperature. Now of course we're all familiar living in the US with the Fahrenheit scale. We use it when we're talking about the temperature outside. Oh it's 70 outside, we know that's nice. Oh it's 42 outside, we know that's kind of cold. <coughs> but scientists don't particularly like that scale. For one, it's fairly arbitrary. Why is the freezing point of water 32 and the boiling point of water 212? I mean, most of life is based off of water, so if you're gonna set a temperature scale, why not base it off of water? 
And it turns out there is some basis for water in the Fahrenheit scale, but it turns out zero degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point of a saturated salt water solution, which just isn't that useful for most people because we don't run across that every day. So Fahrenheit's a fine scale. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not used scientifically. What we use scientifically most of the time is we use what's called the Celsius scale. And the Celsius scale is also a fairly arbitrary scale because we made it up. But what we do is we make it up so it makes maybe a little more sense. As we say, hey, water, basis for life, oceans everywhere. Let's go ahead and set the freezing point for water as zero. Somebody just made that up. The freezing point of water is the zero degrees Celsius. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And then that sets the other scale. And so you can see there's a relationship here between uh, degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. 100 degrees Celsius is the same as 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, we have the equations that relate them. The temperature in Fahrenheit is going to be 1.8 times the temperature in the Celsius plus 32. And 1.8, you might have seen 9 fifths. Um, <coughs> it is an exact number. And we can solve that the other way and find that the temperature in Celsius is the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. One thing to be very careful of when you're putting things in a calculator is since you've got that subtraction up there, you've got to put the minus into parentheses. Otherwise, you often get the wrong answer there. And it's good to have just a sense of what kind of answer you're going to get. You know, hey, if I've got 400 degrees Fahrenheit, I know I should get a fairly large Celsius. And that can help you um, not make as many mistakes as possible. However, in both of these, in the degrees Fahrenheit and the degrees Celsius scale, one of the things I set up is, is said is we just kind of made it up. We just made it up. In fact, that degree symbol here actually means something, and it does mean it's a made-up scale. But what does it mean to make up a scale? And couldn't we have a temperature scale that's not made up? I mean, didn't we just make up temperature to begin with? And the answer is partially yes, but partially no. First, we have to know what actually is temperature. So if we talked about temperature, and you, well, you say when, when there's a large temperature, things are hot. When there's a low temperature, things are cold. But, well, what does that mean to be hot and cold? Like, what's actually going on on a molecular scale? That's what we're trying to start thinking of as chemists, is what goes on on a molecular scale to make things hot, to make things cold. And it turns out it's actually relatively simple. And it is this, that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic means motion. So all temperature is measuring is the motion of molecules. At high temperature, it means you have high motion. At low temperature, it means you have low motion. And that's all there is to temperature. And so that's a great and useful definition. We're going to see that come back into our class, that when we have high temperature and things are moving quickly, different stuff's going to happen when we have low temperature and things are approaching each other very slowly. So if temperature is a measure of kinetic energy, what do we mean when we say degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius is a made-up scale? Well, if it's a measure of kinetic energy, zero temperature should be zero energy, right? If temperature is a matter of kinetic energy, when I've got no temperature, I should have no energy. Unfortunately, zero degrees Fahrenheit and zero degrees Celsius still have a ton of energy in them. They are not actually zero energy because we made them up to be freezing point of water or freezing point of a saturated salt water solution. And that's what these degree symbols mean is that, hey, these scales are made up. It is not actually that zero means zero. So when you use Fahrenheit and Celsius, it's important that you put those degrees there and actually say degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius because they are made up scales. So what scientists did is say, hey, let's, is there a scale we can come up with that's not made up where zero actually means zero? And they came up with what's called the Kelvin scale. That name should sound familiar because I just told you a story about Lord Kelvin meeting Jewel in the forest. And yes, it is the same Kelvin. And what they did is they took measurements, and you can do this actually just by cooling down a gas. It's really cool. And you cool down a gas, and you can figure out where 
zero temperature is. And it turns out that zero temperature is minus 273 Kelvin. I'm sorry, minus 273 degrees Celsius is when there is zero energy. And that's when you have zero temperature. And so it turns out we define minus 273 Celsius as zero Kelvin, or what we call absolute zero. We call it absolute zero because you can't get any below it. You can't get below nothing. So the Kelvin scale is what we use when we're trying to make sure that our temperature accurately reflects energy. And we're going to see this when we get into gases, is that we need our temperature to accurately reflect energy. When we double temperature, we need to double energy. And that doesn't work in the Celsius scale, but it does work in the Kelvin scale. So anytime we want to convert between Kelvin and Celsius, we can use this relationship. It's the temperature in Kelvin is the temperature in Celsius plus 273. Now, if you go on the internet, it's going to say 273.15, which is absolutely correct. We're just going to use the whole numbers for this class. So if you had a temperature in Celsius of 20 degrees Celsius, your temperature in Kelvin would be 20 plus 273, which would give you 293. Kelvin. <clears throat> and then if you wanted to convert the other way, you had a temperature in Celsius and you wanted to convert it to Kelvin, you would, <clears throat> um, sorry, if you had temperature in Kelvin and trying to convert it to Celsius, you'd just subtract 273. You'll notice something about how I did these calculations, though, that's not the same as the other calculations I've done. Is I've been a little kind of loose with my units. It's because we are actually using addition to change units here, which is crazy, and you shouldn't be able to do it, but it works in the temperature realm. So I didn't put degrees Celsius and Kelvin in my units there. I just put Kelvin at the end, and that's okay. If you put degrees Celsius here and you put Kelvin here, I'm okay with that as well. That's fine. But when we're converting temperatures, it's okay to just put in the units at the beginning and at the end. The other thing that gets really weird with temperature is significant figures. So what we're going to find is that when there's temperature involved, we're going to be much more loose about how we use our significant figures. And the reason is because significant figures and temperature is very hard. If I say something is 3 degrees Celsius, I say, well, how many significant figures in that? And you're like, hey, I learned this. That's a non-zero number. One sig fig. Oh, good. And it looks like that. But it turns out 3 degrees Celsius actually has three significant figures. Whoa, 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 how can that be? You don't need to know this. You don't need to know this at all. But since degrees Celsius is a made up scale, it can't have significant figures. What I have to do is I have to convert that to Kelvin and get 276 Kelvin. And that has three significant figures. Because if you remember rules for addition, are digits after the decimal. I've got no digits after the decimal, no digits after the decimal, so I get no digits after the decimal. And only the Kelvin scale, or an absolute scale, can have significant figures. So that's why 3 degrees Celsius has three significant figures. But the take home message is it is really hard to know the significant figures when we're dealing with temperature. So here's my thing when you're converting temperatures, what I encourage you to do is a whole number converts to a whole number. If you're converting 25 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, you should get a whole number of degrees Fahrenheit. A single decimal converts to a single decimal. If you're converting 5.3 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, you should get a degree Celsius with one digit after the decimal. It's not perfect, it won't get you always the correct answer, but it's good enough. Okay, we're also going to find that when we use temperature in equations, we're going to kind of ignore the temperature and its sig figs because it's hard to know when to use the sig figs on temperature and when not to. So that is our temperature scales. So here's your turn. What is 450 Kelvin in degrees Celsius? So you'll pause, try that one out. Okay, you came back. What do we do when we're trying to get from Kelvin to Celsius? The temperature in Celsius is going to be the temperature in Kelvin. Are we going to add 273 or are we going to subtract 273? Hmm. So the temperature in Celsius is going to be the temperature in Kelvin minus 273. 
because <coughs> um, remember 273 Kelvin minus 270 is zero degrees Celsius. So we're going to take 450 minus 273. And what do you come up with there? You can try to do it in your head. You can also get out, it's perfectly okay to get out your calculator and verify that you've got the problem right. 450 minus 273 is 177 Kelvin. Whoops, Kelvin, I wrote down the wrong unit. 177 degrees Celsius. Even I do it, I know the answers. I still make up mistakes with my units, right? But I noticed fairly quickly and I just fixed my mistake. One thing you'll notice though, no degrees on the Kelvin, okay? You don't write degrees Kelvin because it's an absolute scale, you don't need that degrees there. And there's no plural to Kelvin, so you say one Kelvin, you say three Kelvin, you say 18 or 450 Kelvin. There's never Kelvins, so you don't pluralize it. That is our discussion of energy units and temperature. Thanks.